minutes. Approval of minutes from the previous meeting. I think I put three three there, but it was probably three one was the meeting. Um, everybody, I'm sure, has had the minutes, read them, uh, and any. Uh, let's have a motion to approve first. Thank you. The second. Thank you. And any corrections, deletions, uh, comments that we want to make about the minutes. Hearing none, may I have a motion to uh, I may have a vote to accept them as written. Except All in favor, you. say aye. Thank you. Um, second on the agenda is educational report. Uh, Julia and Julia, before you finish, I have just one thing. Well, I'll do it right now. Um, Linda Cass would like maybe us, you, and you and Scott to stop in and figure out what um, more she needs for brochures. And She's stuff. not. She may. She wants to sort of consolidate which are the most important ones and stuff okay. like that. Yeah. So if you can do it and keep in touch with her. I mean, in, yeah. historically, sometimes they would just call Stony Brook or call or, you know, Scott, and he can get them to us. We have done it before. We did it for the Green yeah, We got Expo. those from Starting Board. They, they mailed it to us. In the right. So just make sure that you do that. Check with her. Mm -hmm. And as she said, she's got a lot out there. She's taking up a bunch of space. Uh, okay. See if you can figure out and if you want to get back to the subcommittee, which is you and Scott yeah. and me, and just decide which ones are most important. Do that. I'll okay. Do Good. So then you, you're you up. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, we, we have worked out an agreement um, with the town and Go Hill. So we're going to be um, offering the archery program. It's going to start this July. It's going to run um, four weeks. So it's Saturday. It'll be 9 to 10 and 10 to 11. The first group will be the uh, younger kids, grades 4 through 6. And then um, from 10 to 11 will be uh, grades um, 7 and on. And um, I met with Bethany on Monday. We went over like the online registration. Um, we're now working on a description um, and she's working with Stephen Kylie for like the waivers and things like that. And we're gonna, um, I have to get back to Go Hill about the timing and uh, the storage. And then you and I spoke about possibly maybe borrowing your box right. that we could use for the storing of the, the bows and the arrows and all that. Um, so that was like some really good news. And um, so when you say Goat Hill, I'm sure you're going to the driving range. The driving range, yes, thank you. Yes, the driving range. Um, and then um, myself and two, two other um, community members are getting our B BAI, which is basic, basic archery instruction um, certification on Saturday, June 3rd. So that will qualify us to then teach um, the course. And um, third thing is, um, we uh, worked out with Dr. Dolger, Becca Kusa from Nature Conservancy and Cindy Bell and myself are going to be um, doing a tick education program like we've done the last two years. It's going to be on um, May 25th from 8.30 in the morning to 11 a.m. And it's going to be held in the classrooms this year. Um, that was sort of a nice coincidence. I guess the auditorium was going to be in use that morning, but we actually, the first year we did it, we did it in classroom and it was very intimate and I, I thought the kids kind of behaved better in the smaller room. So we're going to do it again like that this year. Um, and we're uh, changing up some of our, um, our materials and approach just based on how, how things went or didn't go so well last year. So we're excited about that too. And what I think that's, it um, it's four, uh, four through six, grades four through six, yeah. Um, I think that was it, right? I'm trying to remember. I believe that was it. Um, and the only other thing I uh, uh, did do, you did do the, what do you call it? The uh, advertisement in the paper was out. Yes, so we did. The, thank you. We did the advertisement in the paper that came out the first Thursday of April. Right. And then um, I, I had said to uh, Jim that Scott and I should probably talk more this week. I'd like to like kind of set up a schedule of like the social media hits of things I want to do. And um, I just didn't really get to it in March. I was other things right. going on. So this is the time to start. Getting yeah, I think this is a good time anyway now. So sure. And then the only um, other little tidbit, which is just useful for our deer management program is um, I got certified licensed to be a, a, a dog tracker for wounded game. So my dog and I are now official um, legal, you know, team. So if uh, hunters this coming fall, can't find their wounded animal. We're, you know, licensed to track them. So that'll be helpful, I think. Hopefully, if somebody needs it's it. It's nice so. to have that. Yeah, it's a good thing. Okay. There, so, 
that's, uh, that's just actually one, one clarification. When you, when you go to the, to the training for archery, basic archery, yeah. grades four to six, you said, and the second component was in July was? Um, the actual, the, the town um, recreation program is going to offer, it's going to be s Saturdays. It's um, four Saturdays in July from nine to 11. Uh, basically two classes back to back. The BAI course is held in Staten Island and the three of us are driving there and it's from nine to three. Are you going to do it for kids above sixth grade also? Or yeah, just, yes, it's, right. it's, it's, right. so the, the NASA program sure. actually qualifies you to teach anything from grades four to 12. Right. Okay. You know, um, what I might do right here is jump ahead a little bit uh, because it's also under education. Mm -hmm. It's that uh, report on the green options presentation oh, yeah. um, by Moses uh, Sakura. Um, Moses is the entomologist uh, for Suffolk County uh, tick, not tick, but also vector control. Um, and he presented a study that he's been doing and I may not have it exactly right, but basically on the use of um, pesticides, arachnicides for both the conventional, the phermethroids as versus the natural ones. Mostly they were looking at cedar oils um, and it was an excellent presentation. Um, and much of it we know, okay, but I would suspect much of it the rest of the population does not know. Um, Bottom line was, and I'm not going to try to, to give you everything on it, but that the um, permethroids are more effective, they last longer, um, and many people, then there's special times that you should be spraying for the lone stars in the spring, for the adult um, black-legged more towards the fall, for the nymphs a little bit right almost in the middle of that summer times where both of them are, are active. Um, most people spray too much or they're not getting most of efficacy out of their spraying. Um, and there's a lot more information in there. So I've had, uh, Julia actually found the, what do you call it? I heard that it was on, it you. on the YouTube of, and that's from the town or on the town's YouTube. I, I got it from Christina. I just asked her for the Right, link, because, so. Yeah, so she sent it to probably know it because you may get questions about it uh, but I also think it might be good for the general public if we can get we it can... up on our educational yeah. side okay yeah. maybe we'll just talk to Tim okay because he was also there maybe mm -hmm. we'll put it on one side or both sides or yeah. something if we can because it was excellent for people to realize okay yeah. um, hopefully maybe it'll cut down some unnecessary spraying yeah. um, all right um, uh, just the doc, out of curiosity, how, how long a presentation is that? I think his presentation probably ran for a little over a half an hour, maybe. Yeah, it was okay. like 40 minutes. In. Maybe 40 minutes, okay. I mean, it was part of their meeting, um, and, you know, their meeting probably ran a little bit over an hour or something like that. But I would have said, you know, 35 minutes or 40 minutes, as, as Julia said, I'm not just sure. Just looking at uh, the times now with Lone Star in the spring and, and the nymphs in the summer, most people have gone to educate the people that come out, is there any possibility we can get that program once, twice a week on Channel 22? Uh, I don't know. Do we have to clear it with Moses? I'm sure he would say probably okay. It's actually, um, yeah. but you He's know. He's allowing you to put it on social media. I think he well, he already, that's a yeah, he wants, he wants well, he, he should the, be, and it's actually probably, what do you call it? Medical information, so to speak, right. or, or yeah. scientific. So it probably gets out there anyhow. Right. Yeah, share it in the if public you, forum. Right. If you if you just reach out to Moses to get yeah. get give the okay, right. to, he could probably just give you the sum sum and substance of it, or you could crop that previous. Right. You know, if it was an hour long meeting. Yeah, because you don't want to put up the right. whole the whole meeting, just which is probably question. already online. Okay, but just just uh, if you, you're going to put it on a summary too. Something. We might just want to do Correct. it as, as to have somebody crop it for us. Yeah. Just that part. Of I'm it. sure that IT and media can, can yeah. handle that here, right. right? And just reach out directly to Moses to make sure that he authorizes its use in that function, which yeah. I'm sure he will. Right. So, okay. A lot, a lot of people 
do watch Channel 22. It's ama I'm amazed at the number of people that watch it. That Absolutely. Come in, you know, on the street, uh, as we, you know, I talk about a variety of topics. Particularly, you know, this time of the year. You know, when was, downtime. He did say. Some of us older people read the newspaper and watch the television. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, and we don't do the this, this streaming as much. Yeah. So he did say in that presentation at the end that he has a lot of other presentations. Yes, he does. So they're. Just as somebody who used to do presentations like that, there he might have some that's more geared specifically towards your good, homeowner, good point. as opposed to something that he's presenting like here. Because sometimes it's a little bit harder um, to the specific science behind it. It might be easier if he might have something that's specifically geared towards the homeowner. This is why you do this. So it might be right willing to reach out and be like, "Hey, what do you have that we could share for this?" Okay, good point. Um, I watched it. Yeah. It was good, wasn't it? That was great. Yeah. yeah, and I thought it was not overly scientific. Okay. No, it was, it was really good information. It's it was easily, good information. It's easily digestible. Yeah. Like. Okay. So do you want me to do that, or who's doing? Can you do that? that? Yeah, I'll take care. Can you do that for me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, so that's it. So that, that takes care of that section. Also, anything else under education? No. No, I think we're questions, on. statements, nothing. Okay. Just um, related, related to education, where I was contacted by. Uh, Jake Soriano, Sorino, Sorino. He's a, I guess he's a master's candidate at Unity, oh, yeah. right? Uh, uh, and so he's doing his capstone thesis on deer and tick and oh. and uh, uh, pathogen, sort of as a larger umbrella, just mm -hmm. kind of how they all go together. I, I think he's exactly finalized um, the specifics of it all, but generally speaking. Uh, I don't know whether you, Scott, had suggested he reach out to us, meaning the town, but anyway, we're working with him to try and help provide him some information. Uh, as obviously, we have a fair amount of history right. collectively as an institution uh, in, in those fields. So more to come on that. Um, we're going to hopefully work with him. Hopefully, he'll have a nice little thesis. We'll get that when he's done with it and contribute more to the general body of literature. So. Uh, Anything else? All right. And but before I go to you, maybe I just just take care of the rest of this here. The follow up to the Zoom. There's been no change. I talked to Steve Kiley. I asked him if we changed basically if we changed our name from uh, Deer and Tick Committee to Deer and Tick uh, Ad Hoc Study Group or Advisory Board. Would that help us? And he said basically no. It's a matter of how much the town. Thirty eleven though on your part. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. I'm always trying to go around. I don't like. You know, the what do you big business or politics or anything telling us what to do? So I thought we'd try to go around it, but it doesn't work. Uh, but anyhow, what who is in charge of saying what is a legitimate excuse to be there as far as be part of the forum in Zoom is me. Okay, um, so if people have reasonable okay reasons they can't be there, taking care of the public health, taking care of individual health, whatever it is. Call me and I'll do my best to say this is reasonable. Okay, I don't think it's a big problem for us. Um, we're we don't vote very often. So. Well, it's not even that we don't very very often. We need three people to be here on for a quorum in house. All right, um, and we do that pretty reasonably. Okay, you know as far as uh, frequently. Uh, so I don't think that's a big problem for us, but. If it does become a problem, let us know. I think it's probably more of a problem for some other committees that are larger that have a lot of guys all over being on vacation during the winter, stuff like that. Um, so uh, that's where we stand right now. Stephen was looking into other possibilities. He talked about um, some committees may not be necessarily under the same rule and maybe home rule comes into effect at some place. But as it stands right now, we live by the rules, all right, uh, until we don't. Um, anything else? That's it on that. Any more questions on that? Good. Okay. Bo Payne's report. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> year end or seeds and end, I should say, uh, to your management update. Uh, all of our hunting and culling activities ended as of March 31st. Um, we had uh, 316 deer reported to us this year, this season, October 1st to March 31st. I excluded the, that little um, the early season because the there was only two or three deer in there, and that's there's no comparison period for that, so I, I just excluded that. 
Um, it's down just a touch from the number of deer that were reported to us last year. Uh, not, not too surprising there. Uh, we had 88 deer reported uh, from February 1st to March 31st uh, on our deer damage permit. Um, that was down from 110 last year, right? So that's our culling effort when we're out there uh, post-season. Um, we had a little over $2,000 awarded in 12 raffle periods. Uh, 900 of that was just in that February and March period of time. Um, it should be noted there was a number of raffle periods where there was no entrance, right? So we had 12 individual periods, it's once every two weeks, but there was at least three periods where there were no entrance. So nothing, nothing was awarded during those periods. Um, our NUCO program, uh, this is for, for a reminder, we run this uh, at, under the authority of the deer damage permit. Um, we have individuals who obtain nuisance wildlife control operator licenses um, who then are assigned to you know properties that I've identified as as higher priority. So whether they're unhunted or underhunted uh, during the regular season, or uh, perhaps even unhuntable during the regular season due to various restrictions, um, if we can cover them underneath our deer damage permit, we try and focus um, these individuals who have gone and got licensed and insured uh, to, at least in the eyes of the state of New York, um, charge to remove wildlife. Um, and then we have sort of manipulated and adapted that license um, to fit our management objectives. Um, and so those folks go out they're assigned to properties, they harvest deer, they butcher those deer, they give us those deer uh, for our financial donation program, and then we pay them accordingly uh, for that. Unfortunately, so in the past, we've had as many as four NUCOs operating uh, at any one time. This year, uh, we came out of the gate with three NUCOs. Uh, one never materialized at all, never set foot in the field, did anything, didn't harvest any deer. Um, that was that. Uh, we had a new new coach to the program this year who uh, carried their weight very well, in my opinion, uh, which was great. Uh, the goal, just historically for the NUCO specifically, we set that as, at, at 100 deer uh, just to try and say, hey, this is what we're going for. Uh, we, we really, really, really try and emphasize uh, harvesting adult females because they represent the uh, most significant component to population control moving forward. Um, we were successful in taking 57 deer. Uh, oh, and I say I actually uh, left out the number of properties, but it was about the same as last year. It was 57 deer from about 17 properties. We're down a little bit, but um, that was down from eight, 83 deer from uh, 18 properties the year before. So again, we try and spread these folks out. Obviously, if we're only dealing with two folks, um, it's a little harder to, to get them into different, different areas, but uh, nonetheless, we move them around. So the balance of those, uh, those deer taken in uh, February and March were taken by uh, non-NUCO participants, right? So I'm in the field, and then we have people who elect to just extend their hunting season. They would just hunt traditionally. You can hunt under the nuisance permit. Right, right. As opposed to the NUCO, right. which is slightly different. Right. right. The, the, the NUCO really just, uh, you've taken an extra step and you're, right. you're trying to uh, perhaps capitalize more on what we have to offer. The vast majority of hunters have, have no interest in doing this, right? You know, and, right. and the vast majority of hunters have no interest in hunting in October, uh, I'm sorry, in February and March. Um, because at that point they've already been hunting for four months and they're tired, it's cold, they've gone to Florida, they're filling the blank. So uh, nonetheless, I think, uh, I think we did pretty good with what we had. Um, we didn't really seem to have too much of an issue pulling deer out of these properties. If we had a few more people, we might have been able to spread our, our efforts a little further. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, I think we did a pretty good job where, where we were. Uh, if anybody has any questions about that, we can, we can talk. Um, as far as the cold storage and the butchering, 
Uh, we had 140 deer stored through the cooler this year. We had a cooler issue towards the end of the season uh, into February and March, which ironically, ordinarily wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be a problem because it's cold out this February and March. It was warm, so it, it posed a little bit of an issue. I think uh, by and large we handled that fairly well. We we're able to process most of our deer uh, in a very short time frame anyway. Uh, so it, it, I would say maybe it hampered us uh, a very small percentage, but but by and large um, we we didn't really get to a circumstance where we couldn't. Uh, quickly process the deer that we were harvesting. So we, it, it didn't slow us down too much. Um, we're still actually waiting on parts for that. Is it, okay, so you ordered parts for the cooler? Yeah, we have, a, we have our North Fork refrigeration guy who's been working on it again still more. I don't even understand the parts is broken. It's something to do with is electronics. It up to speed, or is it something that will be up to speed by September? It'll be up to speed in September, right. right. Yeah. So, so quite honestly, by the time he finally got to it, we're, we're done with it. And so now it's it's a lower priority, but we have to have it up and running again. So regardless of what that is, um, we're going to get that that situated. Um, number of deer stored in there for personal use remained almost the same since uh, 37 from 36 last year. So it's, it's we're, and that's pretty consistent year over year over year. It's basically the same number of people um, take the same number of deer for their own purposes and then donate the rest. Uh, and the other users are largely just donating them. Uh, with uh, just so over 2,200 pounds of meat this year, uh, down obviously number of deer harvested, number of deer donated, less meat. Small, uh, smaller deer. Smaller deer, deer potentially, right? There's always, that's, that's a never ending Rubik's Cube of combinations of, of why it is what it is, but nonetheless, um, Early on, um, I think the acorn lack of acorn production. Well, that yeah, without that was a major factor in lower smaller deer. Right? So we're down a little bit, but uh, you know that that bumped us up again. We're we're still uh, still producing a lot of of resources for the community. It goes out very very quickly. Uh, I think I'm knocking on the door of 70, 70 people on our notification list now. Uh, frequently. We get nasty grams when there isn't meat available, um, so that's that's always kind of interesting. Uh, but nonetheless, super um, super well received, goes out very fast. This year, I actually um, a couple of times I actually gave people entire deer uh, to process on their own if they were interested in, in in doing that. That saves us on the butchering fee. Not too many people are interested in that, um, but. Uh, then there's no cost to us, right? So it's it just is uh, kind of a win-win. They 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 do their thing. We actually supplied all of uh, the venison for the Southampton Fire Department's game supper. We gave them a couple oh, really? of whole deer. Yeah, uh, they came over, picked them up, and they were really happy with that. So how do people get on the notification once it's on the website? Uh, I don't know if it's on the website so much. There's a there's a usually it's word of mouth, right? Like you you bump into somebody down there. There there was a sign on the door that said if you wanted you know me to just send me an email. Most of the time, it's a friend of a friend said, hey, contact or, or something like that, or they'll bump into me somewhere and say, um, but the issue that most people have is I'll send the email out right after I put out whatever I have. Maybe it's 30 pounds, maybe it's 100 pounds. Um, and, you know, I try to put it out on Friday, typically, as a rule, just so that way it gives people an opportunity. Maybe they're not working Saturday or Sunday. It's almost always longer than an hour or two. Um, <laughs> So uh, people email me Monday and be like, oh, I just went down and there's nothing there. Uh, yeah, you were like three days late, guys. What's the percentage of that meat that actually gets the people in need? No, no idea, Jim. No, no zero, idea. zero idea. Okay. Zero so, idea. So okay, maybe we look into that well, as a possibility in the future because of people that are low income, that are starving and food deprived, actually try to make some type of an effort to get that food you know, on that notification. I'd love to see... And that's like people putting me on there and I'm getting free versus somebody that really needs it. So, so there's a, we, we, we've batted this around quite a bit over, over the years. And um, so having a handle on the number of people who are getting it is different from making an effort to ensure those people will have access to it. So I have no idea how many people who need it get it. 
I do know that there are people who need it that are on the notification list. I do know that I work with Carrie Wood over at the at the food pantry. Um, there is a um, occasionally, unfortunately, sometimes there's a stigma attached to sure. needing needing food. So some people don't um, don't want to be categorized for lack of a better word, isn't it? So what we've we've tried to do is this year actually specifically with uh, with Carrie, I would notify her that I was going to put the meat out. If she knew that there was somebody who needed it specifically, we could reserve it or I would give it to her to put out specifically for that person to come get. So there was a couple of layers of an, 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 anonymity. anonymity. Thank you. Um, so that way the government isn't coming in and saying, hey, you're poor, you need this, yeah. right? That's not what it, that's, that's not what it's up to the senior center, to the people at, at senior center. And, uh, yeah, so we've, we've worked historically I, okay. um, with, with pretty much anybody and, and it's, I mean, I've gone as far as delivering venison to, to homebound individuals in the past. So uh, we, we try to make it as available as necessary. Unfortunately, we need to know that you need it and that's where it usually falls apart. Um, the other thing that we, I personally try to stay away from is that tracking side of things uh, for that reason. And I, in part, what I use to validate that is hunters don't care who's getting it, right? We, we just want, we want it to go somewhere. Like I'm gonna fill your fridge, I'm gonna fill your fridge, I'm gonna fill your fridge, and then I'll keep going. Um, but I, I, I really don't want them to just go in the dumpster. So it doesn't matter whether it's a guy driving a Tesla or a, a, a bike he found in the dump, we, we want people to have it. So um, that's sort of where we set the threshold is if people want it, then they should get it, period. Um, and then the last thing I have for you guys is the flyover, right? Flyover, flyover, what's up with the flyover? Uh, the flyover occurred January 31st, as I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, conditions were generally good for 99.9% .9 of the flight. At the very end, there was a snow squall that came through, um, which affected one transect, uh, which they were able to, to account because they happened to be using uh, two cameras that particular flight. Uh, so they were able to, to cover the area without having covered the area, essentially. Um, the end result, uh, he estimated, they estimated the population 840 deer at the end of uh, January. So when we correct that, right, so we have to, the flyovers happen at different times and we have different harvests before and after. So we try to, Doc and I try to correct that to a, a given day. Typically we try to correct that yeah. to the end of March. When end of March. Our, right. Right. April 1st, our whole is essentially over. over. Right. That's the important number. Right. Not so much the flyover because we take so many deer after the flyover. Right. Fly uh, none, nonetheless, uh, the number get, lends itself to uh, suggesting about 150 uh, deer increase, right, uh, individuals. So what do you think your corrected number, by the way, so for just to... Uh, well, you can take the 840, subtract the, minus, the 88 in February and March, and then you get down to your seven and change there, right? Uh, 752. There you go. Okay. And, and again, versus like 599 last year versus 476 the year before. Right. So we're, we're talking about down to the individual, which obviously is, as we know, somewhat um, arrogant to assume that we can actually calculate it to an individual. Uh, but for the purposes of conversation, yes, right? We, we look at last year. 52 approximately now. 750 ish in there, right? So no less than. Right, and that's kind of the actual takeaway with all of this stuff is, right? No less than X number of deer were harvested. No less than X number of deer were counted. So we know that everything tends to be towards the conservative side of, of the estimate. Jim, that would be the number we got from the flyover. <clears throat> yeah. Minus the harvest yeah, yeah. that has come to bow. Right. It's not counting people that didn't tell bow. Right. It's not counting deer that were hit by a car and died. It's not counting deer that died of natural causes. Has Jim Reed shared you that number of, uh, of 
approximate, or are we looking at car vehicle accidents? With yeah, you? I monitor that all the time. Yeah, okay. right. I, so I, I do that on an annual basis. Okay, right. right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think at the maybe it was the last. That what's that? No, yeah, I usually yeah, do it. Towards towards get it I think at the last. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if I haven't done it, I'll, I'll get it to you, Jim. But yeah. right. I think you actually had maybe we tend to try to look at our numbers on an annual basis right. coming out after January first. We don't have them all. They come out over the next three to six months after that. But what the number what we like to do is look at January first to January first on all of those things. Right. Whereas this deer stuff, we sort of look at it from. April 1st, which is at the end of the hunting season. Um, so post, post so harvest, pre, our, pre farm. Our reaction is one of five town board members, it's 40% of town board here today, um, is that we've had to fly for three years in a row. We're starting to see a steady increase a little bit back up. We quite haven't met that goal of cutting the deer herd in half. And as you've done well with, with the assets that you've had, so my, I'm going to speak as just one board member. Stanford can kick in if she wants. Uh, my recommendation is that we take that twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars for flyover for 2024 and redirect that, so that I, I don't see the reason of, of having four years in a row. It's an expensive proposition, and to challenge the dear committee to come up with some type of strategy where we can I, again getting two new goes out. You know when you have. Maximum, we had maximum four, we had three this year, one that never appeared, you know, that really, if, unless we can get that, to me, the emphasis has got to be on getting more new go people qualified, getting them out there one way or the other, and somehow taking a look at um, the, uh, the raffling, I, I know it's not a big thing, but sitting down with the hunters, somehow or other, we have a target goal of cutting the deer herd in half. Theoretically, that was getting it down by the end of the seat, you know, to a little south of where we are right now. And 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 we talking down for 2022. Now we're in 2023, and the numbers are increasing slightly, which is not as as I'm speaking as just a one town board member. As I love the effort, I love the, the, the direction the committee has gone, but I, I can't go back to my fellow town board members as a satisfied person saying that. Uh, we we got to do better. We, we've got it. We've because we were looking to take the fifty percent down and maybe even forty, you know, just and, and live with there for, for a while. But now we're instead of being at fifty percent, we might be at sixty percent. With that, we're missing out twenty percent of the team. Jim, let me just say one thing. Okay, this is just a data point. Okay, right. O and I need to look at this number very carefully. Look at it uh, compared to the last couple of years and see if it makes sense. Data. We we're going to drive this committee with data. But data has to be evaluated. Yeah. Okay. Does it make sense? Does it correlate with the rest of our data, uh, et cetera? So we will do that. Okay. That's not to say that we don't have, we haven't hit a bit of a wall. And I think we're hitting the wall that the rest of the country has hit. Okay. Less hunters, we've lost space, we've lost places we could hunt with COVID. Um, but, but and we've lost some new goes. We're taking some less deer. Um, all of those things are true. Um, we still have to look at the numbers very carefully. Um, you will not hear from me that I want another flyover, okay? Uh, it's, that's not where we are. We have enough information here to look at it and say, what do we think we're doing here? And from here on, we can plan it pretty well ourselves for the next bunch of years. That plan is take as many gear as we can, okay? That's the bottom line here, is that we need to do it. How to do that is gonna be difficult. Um, and I don't want to hide it from anybody, the town board especially, is that it's getting harder and harder. If you look at not just the number of people out there, and I Baldwin may know better than we do, Mashamak was one third of the island's uh, land mass, more or less. And it's had 50 deer in it or 70 deer or something like that. Yeah. Something yeah. like that, out of 800. Six. Yeah. Okay. Places those numbers, and I remember those numbers because I've been here for right. 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 we, we ended up getting that number in the first two days. Right. So let me just finish though. Those deer have moved. Right. Those deer are now in the center. And it has become very difficult to hunt those deer. And it's going to remain very difficult to hunt those deer. We've also left lost good hunters to age. We've lost them to that wonderful institution of fatherhood. 
We've lost them to illness and disease and death, etc. So we've lost some problems. We have some problems doing it. Now the question is, how do we make that up? And it's not going to be easy. I'm more in favor of seeing if we can push for the nuisance hunters as opposed to new coast might be able to do something. Okay. Um, and we'll see what we can do. We're, that's what we're here for. We are going to do our oh, best. Yeah. Uh, Wait, can I also just add, I just had a thought, like wasn't last year when Sylvester Manor didn't participate to the degree they did the year before? Correct. That's correct. So I'm just looking at this 150 difference. Let's just say 50. I'm um, maybe I'm exaggerating. Could have been lacking from that, from that program. Right. So, right. so if they come back well, in, that's, that's even made. more troubling because this year they did participate. This year, Sylvester Matter was on board and they did take the year from Sylvester Matter. It was 2020. That's what I wanted to ask. Are, are, are we sure it was that this year that they did? Yeah, no, no, that was, back no, so okay. it worked. It's actually worse news because they okay. did cooperate. I think one of the things that I'm, I would urge us to do is we're one island. If we're going to solve this issue of deer density, we have to have to convince people that own parcels of land that have refused. Again, I'll, I don't want to use specific names, specific names, but there are parcels that we used to have that we don't have, that there are tons of deer on, not tons of deer, but quite a few deer. I, I, I walk those properties, you know, when I'm photographing, I'm going out photography. And uh, we, we have to convince those people, we'll never solve this unless we get these people to cooperate to a certain degree. But can I just add, Jim, I, just from my own experience, it's it's a slow process. Like just trying to. I, I, I get uh, it. I'm just saying to you. I just finished, but I'm just saying, just just trying to acquire um, a new property. It does happen, and I think it can happen more. But it's just about the approach, and it just takes some time. I mean, Bo, would would you agree with that? Or? It's a very cumbersome process okay. for what is typically not particularly rewarding. Right. You're forgetting because we're still dealing with, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt both. No. But we're still, we're still dealing with lack of hunters. You can have a new so, property. So I want to talk about that because that comes up a lot. And I, I, I'm just going to touch on it really, really quickly because everybody says to me all the time, um, oh, well, we just need more hunters. Like, that's easy. We need more hunters. That's really not the problem. Uh, it, it, it is a component. It's always a component, right? Because we're constantly running out of people, fatigue, life uh, obstacles, whatever it is, right? So you constantly have to have a pretty full bench to keep filling up the players. Um, I, I just looked really quickly yesterday because I knew it was going to come up. Uh, I took over this program in 2016. Okay, so this is, I think, my seventh season. In that period of time, we've enrolled no less than 79 new people. People who were not either not hunting on Shelter Island or at least not participating with 79, right? So that that's a lot of people. Fewer than 10 of those people have killed more than five deer in that amount of time. And the majority of those people have killed zero deer. So it's it's not a, it's not a, a, a numbers Number, problem. Right. You know, it's not a, a, a sheer numbers problem, right? Unless you look at it as you need like ten to one, right? You need a, something like that, where we need ten new people, so that way we have one person uh, that that ultimately winds up kind of being a a meaningful contributor. And I don't mean to sound like somebody who took one deer one time in a seven year period is not helpful, but that gets kind of lost in, in, in all of this conversation, right? Where it takes a lot of one people to shoot one or two deer over a very long period of time to, to really make up any difference. The principal issue that we have and we're going to continue to have, and I don't at this point have a, a real good handle on how to, to overcome this, is access and it's not access to large properties that's that that that's helpful don't get me wrong super helpful but by and large we're really good at at, at hunting deer and removing deer where we can get to them we're, we're that we have down right somehow or another we'll find bodies to get out there and, and hunt all of our properties that we manage almost all of our properties have deer successfully removed from them somewhere during during the course of the year that changes the dynamic of how the deer are using the landscape right the remaining deer so 
what we wind up having and, and when I'll send out to you guys sort of the, the aerial depiction of, of the distribution of deer, it becomes very, very apparent that there's a lot of deer where we don't get them, right? I, it, it, it's sure. Yeah. It may sound a little silly, but sometimes like it's kind of a... You see them in the car to drive by, but you It makes perfect sense. You're driving down the road, you can see five deer. Well, there's five deer saying there's a big herd of deer. Why can't you just shoot them? Well, because there's... Oh, I Children don't know. playing in the yard. <laughs> well, there's like 15 state laws that prevent us from achieving that. And we can certainly negotiate some of those uh, through a, a slow process. So like you're talking about contact, discussion, uh, you know, uh, negotiation. You go back and forth. Great. Excellent. You go through that whole process and now you have access to where those five deer were once. <laughs> Right. And then we'll go and we'll try and maybe we'll be super successful and get one or two or three of those here. But then those survivors are going to move on to the next area of refuge and the process starts over. Right. So and it goes and, and the smaller the area, the more frequently the process starts over. So uh, using Michelle as an example, easy. One landowner, lots of room, mm -hmm. lots of lots of interest. We can do that. And, and historically, we do a really good job, right? Meaning, meaning the hunters and the management does a really good job because you have that ability to do that. Uh, on larger properties, we do a really good job. We have a lot of interest, a lot of people, a lot of people go, a lot of people uh, take a lot of deer. Uh, we don't have that same level of, of uh, access at a sort of a, a even distribution across the island. Furthermore, well, you might have that during the recreational season, because it's very simple. Dr. B, you could say, yeah, I, I'm going to give you permission to bow hunt on my property. You can be 150 feet away from my neighbor's houses as long as you don't mind looking in backyards. You can hunt there. That's legal. Great. Same doesn't apply during nuisance season, right? Deer damage permit. You can only hunt the properties that are covered under a nuisance permit. So that's a whole nother layer then. It's not like we could just say, uh, well, we have this guy or girl who hunts during the regular season, uh, and we have this homeowner who says, yeah, you can hunt on my property during the regular season. I can't just put them there in February and March. We have to add a whole nother layer of, uh, you know, entering into a agree management agreement, working with the DC, mapping it all out, so on and so forth. So I, I, look, I, I'm not saying that it's an impossible challenge. We're just saying it's a cumbersome challenge, that's all. And that, that tends to be what, what we're currently, uh, what is currently holding us back. So what, what I'm respectfully asking, I, again, emphasis on respectful, right. is some type of, of paper, simple, on sheet, with an RX punt on possible things that we could do differently starting in the September, October of 2023, uh, with a lower a brainstorming of ideas of everything you can conceivably think of that might stand a shot. Working with the town board and trying to, whatever politically we have to do, law changes or things of that nature where we can, we can help, we can work side by side. Right. But I do think there's a certain amount of commitment that has to be done, even from a public relations point of view, with the community at large, not just dealing with individuals, but we're all in this thing together. If we want to have a safe community, and this represents, you know, uh, tick-borne illness is a, is, a, is a real health issue. Doc, you know, knows that, deals with that each and every day on the job, um, especially during the high season when people come here and, and loaded with ticks. Um, Education is important, and Julia you're doing a great job in terms of getting that word out and how to prevent yourself. We want people to get out and enjoy the outdoors. But on the same token, the number one thing that we've always convinced ourselves from years back is lower deer management, successful deer management, and lower the population of the deer. So uh, some type of paper where we, we can identify uh, eight steps, 10 steps, 12 possible steps, even though half of them may never be we may not be able to get to. We need to identify those things and challenge the town board also to work collectively with you and to try to be able to get to that wherever we can help, try to help. 
So I, I, in terms of even financially, in terms of what would you do with that extra twenty five, twenty six thousand dollars? Where, where would that money be best spent? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, to tell you the truth, you know, you can increase the price that you're going to pay your new coats and stuff like that, and it's a two edged sword. They can shoot less deer and make the same amount of money. Right. Okay. Or maybe they'll be incentivized to go out and shoot more deer. But maybe not. People stop shooting deer when they get burnt out. Okay? Especially, you know, the people that get like new coats and stuff like that. It's a long, hard season it's time to do that. Um, you know, so it's not just a matter of throwing money at anything. Um, you know, then I think we have a little bit of an advantage being an island and we've done a pretty good job I'm not sure what we have cut that population down. I'm more and more convinced that our number of 12 to 1400 was probably a very low estimate of what we have. That's not to take away from the fact that we're running into a problem now. That problem is the same problem that everybody else in the country is running into based on suburbanization of America, uh, means less properties to hunt, ideal territory for deer, uh, socialization, excuse me, the suburbanization of um, you know, our social lives, we take our kids to lacrosse practice instead of out hunting, you know, that's hitting everybody and we sort of feeling it now. We were a very rural community 30, 40, 50 years ago. A lot of people hunted um, in and out of season. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we're starting to run into those same problems as everybody else. Two papers which I've shared with this board, one came from Craig Woods, the other I think came from BJ. Both were in non, uh, what do you call scientific publications? One was in white papers. White papers, yeah, well, one of them was in the, what do you call the um, uh, New, Yorker. New Yorker, okay. And basically, the head of White Buffalo said, listen, the deer are here, get used to it. And everything is, that's what we're looking at and switched our whole emphasis to some degree. The only thing that's going to make, and I say we have a bit of advantage because we're in an island, but on the mainland for sure, the thing that's going to make the difference is education and awareness. Sure. Okay. And that's where you have to put your effort. We have got to convince people to, you know, take care of themselves, shower when you come out, spray your pants with the permethroids, you know, put some topical stuff on your skin as far as insecticides. Um, check your kids. Don't put your dogs up on your lap. Things like that is what's going to make the difference and has shown to make the difference. Trying to get that deer population down to where there's going to be a decreased tick population significant to make a difference in health care is going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible. Clearly impossible on the mainland doable on islands of one square mile or less, very difficult on Shelter Island and other islands, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, Block, and all of these people, places are having the same problem. Okay, so we will do what we can. We will get the deer number down as far as we can. But to think that, you know, it's gonna be easy or it's an automatic, you know, it's just, it, it uh, happens that it's just gonna work, until we get that number down to 15 to 20, probably is not going to make a whole lot of difference in the tick numbers. Yeah. Well, okay, you're so going to have... Since you are a deer and tick committee, right. yeah. and we always talk about deer management, deer management, tick management, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about today, but the two things that, since I've lived here for the last 16 years, uh, the lack of burning, which is more of an, uh, an, an issue, obviously, more complicated to be able to do. The warmer winters are a big factor the changing climate, the fact that we get very few days that extended periods of time where the temperature gets down to really bring the frost line down deep with kill ticks, it just doesn't happen. We could get a cold spell for three days where it gets down to the teens and it's right back up to 40 degrees and 45 degrees throughout the winter. You know, I mean, it's, it's, that's going to be a, a challenge to us moving forward in terms of tick control because I think those two factors the lack of burning and the warmer winters is going to preserve a, a whole new challenge to you guys in terms of your tick management program. Yeah, yeah I agree. I was going to say that, um, so Moses did actually specifically say this in his presentation, that there is no correlated specific way that you can say, like, if we lower the deer herd, there will be less Lyme disease. I think we need to recognize that. But it is 
what Jim is saying, getting the deer numbers down is important for the movement of ticks and the host, Absolutely. but it is a multi tiered problem, you know, and this was something that at Meshamic we knew all along, like we knew that the goal, the management of the preserve to be able to have a healthy habitat where you had reduced tick populations, the first thing we had to do is get the deer, the deer numbers down. Correct. The second part of that was doing these other management activities, which I'm trying very hard to get to do, um, to reduce the tick habitat because you can, you can kill every deer on this property. They're just going to find new hosts. They're just going to then bite more people because they still want, you know, well, bite more. In the literature. and so, and so it's a, it's a multi problem. I will say that as far as the, the effects of the deer hunting that you've been doing, and I have no qualitative data to back this up. However, I did just have uh, Mike and Mike Laspia and Scheibel out on the property right. mm -hmm. and Mike Laspia noted that he's seeing the best vegetative recruitment and oak recruitment he has seen at Meshamek in his entire, in his, in his time at Meshamek. So to him, as we were driving around, he was saying that, you know, while we're not seeing that in our specific qualitative data at Meshamek, because where we're taking our measurements is still under the forested canopy where you're not going to get recruitment because of poor management of having a closed canopy, but in our open canopy habitats, you're seeing that recruitment of species that for ever have been completely suppressed by deer. Well, I, th I think that's true. And I yeah. think that we see that more on a subjective basis yeah. around the island. We're not getting a lot of complaints yeah. these days, okay, for about deer, okay? Everybody does, nobody likes sticks, okay? Yeah. But we're not getting a ton of complaints about deer. Uh, the other thing, as I said from the get-go, and I sort of wish we had time to, to go over this, is that we have to look at these numbers very carefully. It is one part of the data process, okay? And if it doesn't make sense, and I can tell you, I was more concerned last year than this year, when last year, when they came up with it, we were up a couple hundred deer, 100 deer, 150 deer. Nobody in the field or even walking the streets thought there were more deer last year than the year before, okay? Yet the numbers showed that. All right, just running the numbers quickly. I'm not going to just go through them because maybe Bo and I, and Bo needs to check my math and my logic. But the fact of the matter is that you take the number of deer that we harvest, the new number of deer, the difference between last year and this year, and that should be the number of deer that's increased, okay? That number of deer that's increased with the exception of the few that swim on or the few that swim off should be new fawns. We get that number. We back it out to say, well, our does have 1.6 or 1.58 fawns each. One, I was just going to yeah. ask you that. Used the formula used to be 1.75. That's correct. The, it's number. The, yeah. the numbers have been coming down. So, right. But anyhow, so we back that out. We, we divide it by 1.6, 1. 1 point something. That should tell us about the number of mature does that we had in that population when we finished up on April 1st. And again, I'm not going to even say it, but just quickly, that number is very high, 60%-ish or more, okay? Which doesn't make a lot of sense. If you have 60% mature does, where are your fawns? Where are your bucks, okay? It can in certain situations, but we've been hunting does out here for a long time. So until Bo and I can look at this again, I would still take those numbers as numbers that have to be looked at carefully, decide does it make sense. And I am a believer in using data but data has to be correlated, data has to be evaluated, and that's where we go from here, I think. So we'll, we'll do that next. Not to say that we're not gonna run into problems with, you know, not taking as many deer, but you don't take as many deer. It was one of the indicators that there's less deer, all right? So I think we have to be very careful how <coughs> far we go down this road until we're ready to say we're starting to get a problem again. Right, I guess it, it depends on how you look at the 150. Like just being a hunter and just considering some of the other factors that might have influenced on why this, to, to say 150 roughly is not so uh, alarmist to, to me at least. Right. I mean, yeah. right. 50 to melt domes last year. Yeah. Right. I mean, so again, yeah. as I said earlier, right, if we're talking, if we're down to the point where we're talking about a wildlife population yeah. to the individual, mm -hmm. we're really, we, we really start to, to blur over a lot of very important moving parts in all of this, right? So, uh, 
that's that that is the difference between three or four people and three or four car accidents right, and and you know so 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 yeah. the 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 numbers are very very small that begin to to out have an outsized impact on some of the the results and that's what doc is getting at is yeah. like what what's the real meaning meaning of that the the takeaway is very very simple right for the flyover last year this year right that despite all of our efforts it appears as though the deer population is increasing to some extent right. and that's really the sum and substance that's of all we know right and i agree that, that's it yeah I can uh, yeah we look to the other indicators to, to try and get a better handle on you know what that means and what we do with it moving forward but that's that's really the the sound bite and i can only tell you that the reason that that you know remember when we used to prioritize the big problems of town and, and deal was either one what was always one well don't say that yet <laughs> no i'll just say and, 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 and it was in the top three always so you went once you went to uh, short-term rentals and then you got into community housing and then you got into municipal wastewater and people have redirected their attention so to speak to all those other topics sure because they are the hot topics of the of the, right. of the time and i was i was going to add you know because i'm i'm on the board of sba we're, we're just not getting as many people like coming up and emailing and calling about you know deer problems at least in our community where where, where you and i live so we used to get a lot of complaints about silver beach deer and it's just we don't hear as much now so. Uh, I think the I think you've hit the nail on the head. The education, the awareness, education, all these things are very important because what are you gonna do? Like yourself in a house? You live out here. And I mean right. there are ticks, there are deer. So so what? Yeah. So so take the safeguards, and if you take the safeguards, your chances of can greatly be reduced of getting any tick-borne illness if you do the right things. It's a question of just being able to take the population of people that don't live here and that are not aware of, of these safeguards and educating them. And I mean, and we are from the other end of it, we're slowly starting now, maybe an archery program, yes. maybe that will inspire down yes. the road, one or two individuals to become bow hunters when they're adults. I mean, it, again, that's like, or it's you're starting on, like from scratch and moving forward. It's all like a slow process, just like the attrition of hunters was no, I think top term, but slow too. And then now we're here. This committee, I don't know, I'm not this because yeah. I spoke too much today, but that's typical, but. Uh, we used to spend all our time at this meeting, and Scott will attest to this, sitting here arguing about taking deer versus taking rodents. You know, I mean, we, this, the committee has improved that. <laughs> dramatically. A lot of it has to do with the addition of bow and, and the people that sit here up here. We have a much, it's a smaller group of people, a more, a more uh, well-educated group of people, people that are, you know, definitely in, in invested in working together and there's, there's not that, oh, you remember the art? I mean, it, 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 I sat in the audience. I remember. Yeah, I with <laughs> kind of here going, you know, uh, <laughs> the same issues, arguing with the same two or three people. So you guys have, have gone and, and really have done a, an amazing job moving forward. I just obviously answered four other people on the town board, and I make my reports. And, and I, and you know, obviously I've been very invested in this even before becoming a councilman. I love the committee. I love the work that we do. There is a challenge out there. I'm, I'm one of those people like, don't be satisfied. We can do better. We, we, you know, we have to work at upping our game. This is the coach coming out of me in the locker room before the game. We need to play better. So that's what I'm saying. Let's not, because to be honest with you, we let our guard down. If we don't do our job, we'll be back to 1,400, 1,500. And then it can happen in a couple of years. And, and but. With none of this being any of my area of expertise, obviously, um, other than very anecdotally and qualitatively coming from growing up in an area that is one of the most hunter prone culturally, there are still more deer mm -hmm. in Texas and Arkansas and all of these places that are hunter. You can you can train everybody to hunt right. and you can't chase them everywhere. You can't control their environments everywhere. It's never going to happen. You put deer feeders in every every place you want to put them. And the deer, there's still a deer, a white tail problem all throughout Texas. There's an access problem all throughout Texas. And there, people, it's constant. It's never going to happen. But more importantly, you know, um, maybe not more importantly, but from my point of view, the question of what the purpose of the deer and tick committee is. If the purpose of the deer and tick committee is to focus on this question of a rising public health issue as far as uh, 
tick-borne disease and transmission is, then that point of deer control, vector control, not having, as far as I'm aware, way outside my, my area, but any measurable impact on uh, rise of tick-borne disease, right, particularly with Lyme, right. then it is worthwhile to think about for whatever reason it is worthwhile to think about deer management as a pest or a, a, a whatever. Um, but the only thing that's going to matter really is probably twofold, right? It's the education part that they've been talking about, explaining you get a tick off within a day, your likelihood of Lyme is, I, I'm, I'm never going to tell someone zero, but it's practically non-existent. It's, there's no studies that I've ever seen that showed Lyme within 24 hours. Um, with the, you know, the best studies say 48 to 72 hours is where your risk point is, 36 is kind of the cutoff, but that's where the education comes in. So, and you're, you're talking about like telling the people who are here and then also talking about the public health uh, movements that are happening, right? So Stony Brook University, Stony Brook Children's is partnering with Pfizer. There's a phase three trial for the a new Lyme vaccine that they're actively recruiting for right now. Those things are where, and as those hopefully become available, if they're effective, if they're safe over the next couple of years, the committee also being a point of contact to explain and disseminate that information through education efforts, um, that's the only thing that's going to really lower tick-borne illness I'm on Children's Island. Like the, the efforts that we do at, at the Green Options Committee, it's, it's, it's very nice that we have it just across the street from the Crafts Fair. I feel like when, when I went out and just met people and handed out those brochures, almost everyone that I handed out to really didn't know about, like, they didn't really know what to do. Like, oh, yeah, I've been meaning to ask about ticks or, yeah, we get ticks all the time. So I think that kind of thing is just very helpful because you get a lot of tourists that are visiting and right. just that like face to face. He, here's a flyer. Read it. Th that actually, I think, is, is very beneficial. It's, and we can have some, you know. Kind of skull session, trying to figure out what we can maybe, do. Maybe. maybe, maybe you know, a booth down at IGA on a Saturday and Sunday with maybe. some literature. I mean, Whatever it is, we can talk about that. Yeah. And well, that's what our job is, and we will do that. Um, just to, you know, it's not easy. I mean, the difference with the deer, as I see it, and Bo can speak to this, is you need a guy or two who's willing to kill fifty to one hundred deer. All right, and we've had those in the past. And that makes a difference. It does. What's that? It, really it, does. it does. Okay. And we don't have that today, right now. Okay. Uh, if we find one or two, that will make a difference. Um, at least for, you know, a year or two until they move, leave, get old, get married, do something. Um, so we'll see what happens. But we'll keep working on it. That's all I can say. So we, I had a question for you. What, what would, uh, doc, based on what Doc just said, you know, when a deer tick gets on you versus a lone star gets on you initially and it grows up on you, does anybody know the approximate number of minutes, hours that before they start to actually embed them? So, oh, 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 lone star is more act because they're bigger ticks. You, you feel them more. So, I mean, it's easier to know when a lone star is on you than a deer tick is on you. Obviously, they're so much smaller. But is it, a bit, is it normally a, a, a three to five, a six hour, or is it a six to 12 hour? Or is it vary depending yeah. on where the tick wants to go in your body? Yeah, ticks will crawl, and once they find a spot that they feel Com comfortable attaching to and feeding, mm -hmm. they'll do it. It could be at the sock line, or it could be at the waistline. Right. So, you know, it, that time that it takes to crawl, obviously, uh, Lone Stars can cover that distance a lot faster. They're free. Right. They, they walk um, faster than black-legged ticks. Um, but it really has to do with how they, I mean, they're not going to attach if you're wearing shorts. But if you have pants, they may attach, you know, in the back of the knee. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it varies uh, with, with the person um, and, and the tick species that how it travels and, and where it'll attach. Um, but, you know, they, they will attach within 24 hours, typically. So you want to do frequent tick checks. You want to remove the ticks as soon as possible. Um, as we said, you know, the, the faster you get uh, the tick off, the, the greater you reduce the risk of any of the pathogens, not just Lyme disease. There's a bunch of them. Um, the only ones, the, and the only ones that transmit very quickly appear to be the viruses, which again is, uh, you know, uh, Poisson can transmit within 15 minutes. 
So you want to get, you want to do frequent tech checks with, when you're in the field, when, as soon as you get home. Uh, I always uh, promote a tick check the following morning, even though you haven't been outside, because sometimes those ticks will attach or a tick will attach and you'll get redness around the attachment site. So that little small tick is now bigger visually. So you, you still, still 12 hours or so you within the 24 hours and you can get them off then. So the, the, you just frequent tick checks uh, is really what everyone in public health promotes. Um, is there any in Powell's in Suffolk County? Yes, we have, we have Powell's. It's, uh, it's actually right. Or just isolated. Clinically, we've had one case, case right? but we have found in the ticks. But the, uh, the good part about the virus is the infection no, no. rate is very, very yeah, low. It, it's ex so, yeah, it's very, very, low. very single, low. Single digits. This is, well, yeah. that was one of the big takeaways at the, yeah. the tick-borne symposium last year, whenever we had in Southampton yeah. last year, it was like, yes, it's, it's there. That's yes, right. it's yeah. been isolated. Uh, transmission still seems very, very low. It's the one that you can transmit the fastest, but the likelihood of it is still very, very, very low. Yep. Very, I remember very when low. that first came out and we started talking about it and people got very scared it's because it could be fatal. Right. Okay. It's, 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 if you looked up fatal. the incidence of a Swas a Swanson, uh, in New York State versus uh, being hit by lightning. Yeah. You had a bigger it's, chance of being hit by lightning than of yeah. dying from possible. Right. So, it, I mean, it's possible, but very, right. very, very unlikely. Right. Right. So, have we found out about that disease where the deer were dying for a couple of years with, with the oh, he, thirst? Is, 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 is that, what? that what? 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 have you noticed that? Have you noticed that decline of our deer now adapted to that? It, it just it's never materialized this, this past fall, it, right. contrary to everybody's expectation. Yeah. It, I mean, I I know of I think one deer that was suspected in the in this past fall, but I, I didn't hear of anything. You would know better than me. I'm not connected to the no. to the stuff. I haven't heard of it. Anymore, but no, uh, again. EHD. EHD. Yeah. A bazootic hemorrhagic disease. Hamptons, like we were talking about yeah, yeah. yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Epizootic hemorrhagic disease yeah. is what it is. It's a virus transmitted it. by midges, okay. and typically you find those in the fall. The the, um, the midge numbers increase, increase and, and you have the transmission and of the virus. First, first frost, yeah. it, stops. it stops. Yeah, right. You, you need the midges. So once okay. the midges are gone, you don't see the transmission. Your EHD outbreaks are typically right. September, October, November. Okay. Yeah. That's being studied in Suffolk oh, as well as all states right currently. Um, so, do you, do you uh, have the maps from the flyovers, the, the, yeah. the GIS maps? Yeah. Um, have you, or has anyone looked at the population of the deer in uh, areas that are not accessible to hunting? Yeah, so... Because obviously access we've, we've discussed, it yeah. is, and that's the core problem with every deer, every deer management program in the country. And we have way more access, like per capita, yeah. than, than most any other community, right. probably yeah, anywhere, good. as an overall municipality. But that's probably one of the major reasons uh, deer management programs aren't as successful, is right. because you can't get to the deer. Right. So, I mean, there may always be a core population in that inaccessible Absolutely. area. Once they become a certain population, they're going to migrate out of there and be, then they're accessible. So that core is, do you, we do you have any idea? Yeah, so we call those the deer factories, right? Yeah. That's that's what makes the deer and sends them out into the rest of the world, Yeah. right? Two uh, main. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we, we have those here, right? Like I could I can use the center of town as a very easy example, right? right? There is a core group of deer, right? Or a, a group of deer that uh, they're, primary core area. So right, deer have home range, which is all of the area that they'll probably go, most likely, mm -hmm. right? So for those of us living on Shelter Island, our home range is about out to Riverhead most of the time, <laughs> right? But our core area is where we spend most of our time. So that's between your house, the post office, and IGA, right? <laughs> By comparison. So if, if you have Deer core areas uh, in largely inaccessible areas, they tend to stay in those areas the more that they're pressured and experience other 
I would say uh, significant life events, right? They're gonna they're they're gonna fawn in those areas. They're gonna retreat to those areas when there's pressure. There's they spend an, an inordinate amount of time in those areas. We have there's a group of deer in the center of town that their core area is the center of town, right? They very rarely venture out beyond, let's say, Midway Road and. Uh, just I'll use a larger version, but and we'll say uh, St. Mary's and rarely north of uh, uh, IGA and rarely south of Smith Street. Right? Well, well, the, the study area. the study showed that the basically that core range is about a mile. So all the the deer, except for bucks, they'll they'll obviously move right. more, right. but but the does will stay within about a mile of that. Yeah, area typically area. even even. Yeah. They don't need to go. They don't need to go. There's plenty of food. There's plenty of food. Pressure. Pressure is the leading reason for pushing deer out of their core area. Again, they really don't like leaving their home range ever, but occasionally they will. Um, Luckily, on Shelter Island, you you can't really get out of your home range. Um, So yeah, there's there's lots of of those little areas that have become uh, areas of refuge to. Uh, groups of deer that then, and we saw this uh, with the tag deer, right? Where we had, we had, despite uh, however many years this is, right? 10, 12, 14 years of, of significant coordinated hunting efforts. You had tag does that lived in the same area for years and years and years, right? We had the one in Silver Beach, right? When she finally died, she was 14 years old. I was going to say 13, but I know. And she died about 100 yards from where she was tagged, right? And that we hunt in that area, right? So, so, it, and that's that. That's there's other areas that we don't hunt in. That she had triplets for uh, a couple of years, right? Was, yeah. Which is exceptionally Damn rare. But, right? um, so, yeah, and and those those begin to uh, you can you can start to articulate those areas visually. With the, with that map, where you see like, okay, this is this is the Smith Street deer, this is the Nostrum Parkway deer, these are the the Westmoreland deer, right? I, I mean, I have this conversation with the contractor after he's done with everything. We talk, and one of the ways I try to sort of like blind validate what he thinks he's seeing is I have him describe to me where he's seeing deer initially, right? Where oh, it looks like there was eleven deer. Uh, at the, at the northwest intersection of bootleggers and West Neck Road. Yeah, there's yeah. 11 deer that lay on the other side of that privet hedge every single night, and 11 is the number. Like, like we, we know this. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we can see that, Scott, and, and hypothetically, I've thought, okay, let me draw a circle around those areas, and then... I mean, we have, we have the tools to do this, right? Like, I can use GIS, a butter stool, drop a pin, contact every single person, within any distance I want, 150, 500 feet, no problem. Um, great, great conceptually, right? And and to that end, I've done that before, right? I've gone to HOA meetings and presented and say, hey, you want hunting to get your five neighbors to agree and then come back and talk because uh, the way that the, the law works is we almost always end up with a checkerboard effect, right? Where we have permission and then one lack of permission stymies the whole thing. Um, but as far as trying to, to hone in on a given area, absolutely. The flyover gives us that tool. We can then also, I can highlight areas where we already have active hunting programs. It's, it's typically pretty much where there's no deer, right? At this, in, in these circumstances, it's very few deer uh, compared to the rest of the areas. So we can, we can focus our, our efforts using that without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't know if there was uh, any comparison between the last three years. Uh, for they're all the same. Inaccessible. The yeah. same I, I and those areas are still inaccessible. Right. They they were right. then. So that's right. so that's really you know that that deer factory is yeah. really the bane of our existence in trying to get access to those deer. Right. Um, and some may not be accessible because of all the laws. Right. Right. And, and then obviously permissions and things like that. It's so the one advantage of having a flyover in January as opposed to one that year we had it end of February, March. Because if you get if you had the flyover in mid-January, so to speak, 
and you get the data back a month later in mid-February, you still have six weeks of the, the management uh, season to be able to know exactly where they are. I mean, it's, if, well, if that's helpful. Respectfully, but, though, what winds up happening is, it's, right, we kind of know, but it's also not, uh, and again, it's, it's sort of, uh, if you don't, if you're not doing it, you don't, it doesn't make sense. It's not like flipping a switch, hypothetically. I know where the deer are. I've lived here for 30 some odd years. Uh, I, just because now I see it overhead or I see them on my way to work doesn't mean I can go and get those deer. So we still, we still know that it does provide a very useful tool in helping to articulate that to other individuals when they say, I see the same six deer every single time. Yeah, no, we see them. We got them. Like, look, they're right here. Can you tell me how to get to them? Please. What angle would you like to see them in? Right. Side, top, <laughs> right. 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 which one would you right. like to see? Right, so, so like to your point earlier, Jim, like what can we do? The single? Probably the single best thing. Anybody who is who is concerned with a deer population or concerned with deer numbers could do is allow deer hunting on their property mm -hmm. and encourage or convince, if they can, their neighbors to not stand in the way of that. I'm not saying they even have to allow hunting on their property, but just by uh, not giving permission, they can actually prevent us from hunting on property we do have permission on. Right. So that's probably the single easiest thing that any any one person Maybe could do. Maybe homeowners association meetings again. Or something. <laughs> right, the homeowners association meetings. You know, again, that winds up typically turning into. A neighbor issue, that right? Like, well, I would, I, I want my property hunted, but he won't let me. Okay, now this is we're we're, we're digressing, right? We're trying not to do that. Right, so, right. Um, I'm not uh, trying to say anything that we have tried won't work. Uh, all I'm trying to to articulate is uh, we've identified these issues a long time ago, and we have not been able to surmount them yet. So. Uh, we keep working on it. But you're also dealing with a, a animal and you and Aaron. So then you have your nice property, you send a couple guys out there, women, then you have to, you're dependent on the deer behavior. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, so let's use the center of town, right? I mean, like, I get permission, I get permission to, shoot, I mean, shoot, you know, to like, hunt deer over here uh, from the residence between uh, Bateman and Thomas. Yeah. 114 and, and right I get everybody there I get I have that whole access I go there one time I shoot one deer maybe it's the wrong deer and wrong deer through hierarchy um, those deer shift right. and now yeah. this portion of their core area becomes their preferred portion of the core area because there's a threat there now that never works right. so now we got to start this whole process over again right one two three four five six, so, so on and so forth again not insurmountable it's just might be insurmountable. Exceptionally, <laughs> I would say. Like, I don't know who's making all those phone calls. Yeah. Like, like, like I'm not doing it. Right, 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 <laughs> like, right, right. Right. There isn't yeah. the time in the day to be doing that right. all of the time. Can, quite frankly, can I ask? A, I don't know if there's an answer to this question. Is there a non-lethal control option? Meaning, like, for if we know that these are does that have this home unit, like, okay, like your birth control. Yeah. Can be like throwing a feeder and so, it doesn't work. And so uh, fertility control does yeah. exist. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there, there's a whole litany of, yeah. of things, and, and we could talk about that outside of here yeah. or read the deer management plan. It addresses Wasn't some there. of that. Yeah. Uh, um, but there is uh, a, another exceptionally unpopular tool that is very rarely uh, implemented, but I suspect it will start to be implemented. Report and Jim, to, again to your point about like next level thing, like what do you do? What, mm -hmm. what what's the next thing? Um, trap and euthanize, mm -hmm. right? That's actually a thing, and um, there are no discharge requirements for that. There's still baiting mm -hmm. required. Like you, you still have a lot of regulatory complexities, but then you do get around. Um, the need to get permission to discharge a firearm or or archery equipment yeah. right like you if you got it as a tool you could trap and kill a deer right there mm -hmm. do they right still there. use the meat you still use the meat or yeah yeah so that's so another that's complexity right they, the the dec i had extensive conversation with the dec about this recently because i knew this conversation was coming um, their preferred method is chemical euthanasia right because uh that's Basically, the Humane Society sort of puts out a whole matrix of how and when and who should 
uh, euthanize animals in what order and, and to try and make it as reasonable as possible. Um, so the preferred method is chemical euthanasia. Chemical euthanasia automatically uh, uh, terminates any human consumption concept that you have. So can, can, you, can you do like CO2 change? Captive bolts. Same thing that they use to kill cattle on farms. Captive bolt, right? Which is pretty much what it sounds like. Bolt into the head. Um, uh, is, is a tool. You have to have somebody who, you have to have them. You have to have somebody who knows how to use them. You have to have an additional captive bolt because you can't just have an animal bouncing around in a trap that needs to be euthanized immediately. And, oh, this one's not working. Right. So there's just a lot of, there's uh, logistics that go with that, just like hunting, just like uh, fertility control, any of those things. Uh, there's logistics that go with it. It tends to be, like, if you think, Hunting tends to be sort of a hot button issue um, in the places where this is has been experimented. Yeah. It's yeah. it's a pretty uh, it generates a lot of public interest. It also takes an awful lot of effort. <laughs> Enormous man it's more, it's more, more manpower to do like any that. of the and money. Man and you'll have both hunters and non hunters on the same side arguing against yeah. it. It's no place you want to go. It's no place that you want to think said, about. That's it, right? Like, like, we have who to, does that? Though? We have to to contemplate tools in the toolbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, can't yeah, just yeah, say yeah. that there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think what Jim's point about let's maybe get together and start thinking about right. that. I mean, do we extend our nuisance into April? Okay. Do we try to look at you know nuisance hunting during the regular season, which maybe people could bait then. Maybe that would help. Some of which has its downside, and I'm not advocating those things. Okay. The well, last thing we do want to do is have our local recreational hunters against what we're doing because we still take the majority of our deer sure. with those with the recreational hunter. So these are not things I'm advocating. Should we would be remiss if we did not point out that we've already teetered on that edge. Yeah, absolutely. Right. No, like, we've lost some nucos right. and people because they think we've taken enough deer. Right. Okay, there's no question about that. Um, so there are possibilities which are have their downside and we have to look at those downsides very seriously before we go further down this road and get into a huge public discussion about it because public they all have a bias they all have an opinion they all have a a you know an emotion that's going to be you know thrown out there and, and that's not, not that's not how we want to deal with this we want to and, deal and, with and, this. and who does this trapping like us new or, or yeah, so there's there's different, basically, it would be a permitted uh, activity pursuant to a genetic permit, then the person or persons <laughs> who are actually qualified, and the DC doesn't even have, they say you have to be qualified, but they don't actually have a qualification process, so it's, you have to develop that. Um, those those licensees, those permittees would have to actually be physically doing that. Um, and I, I've handled live deer many many times it is a very exciting uh, <laughs> circumstance uh it's uh it's, it's like doc said very labor intensive i would also think that that alternative wouldn't get to the whole um like if the idea is that there's people that are just against the idea of killing deer oh sure. you know in the in say your your hotbed areas I think that that probably wouldn't be the like the hey we're gonna try, like that wouldn't be like the alternative yeah. that that's what like, i was I feel asking like if if you had that hot area you it's just better to yeah. use your other tools. Yeah. like this is this you don't need to yeah. capture them you just shoot yeah them. that's why i ask about this oh, right. the alternative was because i was like if if you have these areas like the so um, the center where you can't, you know you get your patchwork matrix of people that for whatever reason don't give you access and that prevents you from larger areas if you have this other tool, given it's more expensive, you could uh, what sort of deploy it in just very targeted areas where you have, like, say, those eleven deer that sleep on the other side of the hedge, right. and maybe, and that may be a way to target those deer. The people can still have them that are don't want you to kill me, don't want you to take the euthanasia side of things, or may not for whatever reason a, approve of that. That would be a non. That was, so that was the, the we, and that's that's the normal that is the normal you know sort of position that people yeah. take right so you you have deer but they, you you shut down the factory right yeah. so eventually so attrition only then um, occurs yep. right based on natural or DVC death mm -hmm. right um, which which 
typically then leaves the, the largest concern is you're, you've done nothing to address the environmental and, and human deer conflict side of things. So yeah. you've stopped the reproductive side of things, mm -hmm. but they're still going to run across the road and get hit by a car. They're yeah. still going to eat every oak yeah. seed sa sapling yeah. that they can find, that sort of thing. So yeah. um, typically the return is exceptionally slow. Yeah. As I just mentioned before, we have actually had deer live here to 14 years. So, yeah. so your return on that, um, and again, there's at, there are certain applications where it is the right thing. Yeah. Uh, but typically, yeah. uh, I remember that when you gave the prep, there are no predators here. So the life expectancy for, yeah. for deer here is longer than it is up in the wild. You sure. know, Farm yeah. recruitment is higher. Every, every, there's no everything. Everything in suburbia here is geared towards increasing yeah. deer population and survival. I would close the fine line that you walk, which has been great, because you really have finessed this very, very well with the local deer hunters. You haven't really annoyed them to the point of, of rebelling and, and writing articles in the paper. No, no, no. To really be honest with you, you've handled that extremely, extremely well. One thing I would say that part of the RX that I ask you to put together is, and I know you have done this and you have it stored in your mind here, is that the feedback that you get from your core hunters, you know, uh, so I, I would love to be able to know. I don't think you want that information. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, we, uh, we I would because, uh, you know, I, you never show my top, my top producer told me that we have too few deer and we should probably stop doing this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing, like, you get to but, a point where I, I, you know, some, sometimes I, I, I that perception is important to me, though, right. and I think it should be important to the committee. Oh, it is important. So, so even getting negative feedback, by the way, uh, you learn from it. So uh, that's an attitude. If that's starting to spread with the recreational hunters, we, we, we need to know that because that's an important information in terms of tactically. How do you how do you address that with? Jim, because these are your core people, as you said. Jim, last year. Hunters I take have a bias, okay? So I you listen to them, I believe them, but yeah, they would have to have more gear, myself included, I'm a hunter, okay? Last year, two, two people came up to me on the street, non-hunters, yeah. said, you killed all the deer on the island. I don't see any deer on there, which is not true either, obviously, okay? <laughs> but that was the perception last year. Okay. Uh, and, you know, so it's a fine line that you're, you're dealing with here, and it's not much more we can do we can try to keep it done but we have to do it not you know with low profile okay we have to move with without trying to get out there making too much of out of this take as many deer as we can and I, that's all i've come up with is we try to take as many deer as we can bo and i and others can talk about other options if maybe if they allow crossbows that'll help okay but that's a state issue um so maybe we, it won't help we've uh, talked about this in the right. past, and, and I think we kind of come back to this all right. the time, and what we've already articulated here is um, most deer management programs throughout history have ultimately um, settled into uh, managing for social carrying capacity, right, rather than ecological carrying capacity right. or uh, desired scientific stated goals of, of right and arguably that's where we've gotten to right where we've got to the point where we've already had these the, the number of complaints saying we're we're taking too many deer the number of complaints saying we're taking too few deer the number of deer vehicle collisions was relatively decreasing and or stable um, we're seeing some robust ecological rebound in select areas, right? So combined, this sort of maybe ultimately winds up, we wind up being yet another municipal deer management program that moves away from this defined, we have to get to X number of deer per square mile and adjusts back to the point of saying, well, when people start complaining there's too many deer, we're going to try and do more to take more deer. When people complain there's too few, our hunters stop hunting, that's self-regulating, right? The hunters stop taking deer, the deer population increases, they're gonna have more success next time. That, that you know, it kind of balances itself out. But I think that's where we've almost inadvertently found ourselves anyway. Well, we're finding ourselves right. there, okay? I still think that 
it's our job as this committee to try to take as many as we can, okay, and not just to stop, all right? So I think we continue that effort, realizing that it is very difficult and is probably unsuccessful in most places on the mainland across this country, that you just are not going to get them down to numbers that are we're talking about in the old 15 to 20 or 10 to 15 per square mile. That day is gone, and will be gone until Mother Nature decides to take care of it, which it may do one of these days. So that DEC recommendation per, per uh, square mile, you know, that 8 to 10 or 8 to 12, whatever you want to read. And, you know, at one time when we were up to 1,400 plus, we had uh, 110 per square mile, you know, based on the square mileage we had. We're, we're north of that. We're north of that. We're north of that. So, so part of the educational process also is, why does the DEC recommend an 8 for 12. What, 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 it also, for the people that love deer and are concerned about the welfare of deer, it's in a healthier situation, you know, that kind of thing for deer to get those numbers down as opposed to allowing those numbers to go back up. So, I mean, I, I, again, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I think of it as historic, some of it is probably historical numbers, yeah. you know, and you know, that's. Before we had Lyme disease, before we had a lot of complaints, before we, that number was in that range of 8 to 15 or whatever it is. Like recently, I've read 10 to 20. Um, but those days are gone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, people don't like coyotes any more than they like deer. They don't like mountain lions any more than they like deer. Um, you know, so you don't have the predators that you have. Um, you know, you just. Sponsored by old white guys. Yes. <laughs> When they run out of food in the in the big woods, and some of it's big woods, so when they run out of food in the big woods, they starve. Hard winter will kill them. Down here, they eat the rhododendrons. Yeah. And if we eat too many rhododendrons, we plant more. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they don't have that same biology, okay, ecology that the big woods historically was. I mean, that's changed. And that's all part of that quote unquote, you know, suburbanization of, of America. And it's all filters into that. Sure. They have less of a problem. I won't say they don't have a, a problem, but they have a less of a problem up in the big woods of Maine uh, than they do down here as far as numbers of deer uh, yeah. stuff. So, I mean, deer management, I mean, deer ungulate problems across the United States are is terrible. And I think that what Bo was saying about hitting, you know, instead of getting to this point where it's like we want to get what was the target 50 deer, whatever the target was right. maybe we're at that point where like all of these sort of we're at the we're at the capacity we can get to and you're going to have that natural sort of ebb and flows of as more we put more pressure on because there's more deer than the right. deer number sinks and then just like in nature all of a sudden there's less deer less people are hunting you know like oh we don't want to go out and expend that much energy so you switch to something else deer numbers go back up deer numbers explode more people are hunting and it's going to be an ebb and flow but if you can get to that point where um as a land manager i'm able to see recruitment of vegetation that i want if we have this 850 deer across the island i assume that is, that counts the shamic deer mm -hmm. yeah um then then maybe that's that's you know regardless of what that swing is i mean because you're talking of you were mentioning like we're down to counting individual deer like that's a swing that's a right. that's a natural we can't you know that's not sustainable right. you know you need to let that happen and I, I think we're i think i agree with what you're saying i don't know I'm just reiterating mm -hmm. li listening to myself talk like i think maybe that's thinking about it like i come from a background in invasive species plants and like you can never eliminate the invasive plant but you get to a point where it's not affecting your other management or ecological goals but Cody, you're educated in this field yeah. okay the hard part is not that yeah plus accepting it yeah it's convincing the general public that this is a level that we're at it's going to ebb and flow a little bit yeah. all right but we're going to have to accept this level and i mm -hmm. think that literature is coming more and more on the mainland yeah, is that, that's where we're at, people. Yeah, uh, you, let's deal with the other things that we can. Or take, let's take care of your health. Mm -hmm. Or if you have problems with the meat in your plants, plant deer resistant plants. <laughs> okay, um, you know that's what we have to get. But that's not that's the hard part. Oh yeah, that's the social part that I find it's not hard talking to you guys and saying, listen, you know we've done what we can. We're at it. We're going to keep it up. We're going to keep trying. It's going to be convincing the public 
that here's where we're at, mm -hmm. all right? Um, there's gonna be some ebb and flow of this up and down. And Bo, I know you have to get out of town too today, so if we can, I can call this, it's a lot of just yeah. talk. Yeah. Um, but um, that's gonna be the hard part is get people, and also the other problem is this, there's this quote unquote associated disease yeah. problem. And so it makes it a little bit more difficult than just eating plants. Let me tell you something, if they were just eating plants and ticks were yeah. yucky, I wouldn't be on this committee, yeah, okay? Right. Uh, yeah. there, is, there is this disease issue yeah. that we have to do our best to take yeah. care of. And the literature right now is supporting education yeah. to take care of that disease problem as best as we can. Well, true, education, and, public education is one of the most difficult parts of any program you're ever going to do. I don't care. I don't care what it is. It could be it could be drug education programming. It's the most difficult part because changing the public perception of what you're trying to do. Right. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to change someone's perception of something like that's the most difficult part. And it's it's being able to, you know, it's being able to communicate in the way people understand It's being able to communicate to a variety of people that learn in different ways. I mean, I'm telling you guys anything you don't know, you're all in public service. You get that. Um, and, and I, you know, that, I think that's, I think it's true trying to create a, a public education program that can, that can, that can accurately, you know, give that information to people that have varying degrees of understanding of what it is they're, they're hearing. It's something that some of the other committees can do like the CAC and the green options is like, I, I remember last year we had a podcast that we posted on our, from the Deerington committee about setting up your landscape, your home and like your lawn mm -hmm. and your gardens in a way to make it inhospitable to ticks. There's a way of, of mm -hmm. designing and planting and not letting stones and rocks and sure. grasses versus other things. Um, so that, we still have that information on our website. It's actually okay. on our, it's on our, I went to right. the and Tick and the podcast is still, the link is still there. Right. So I'm just saying maybe something like that, like talking to homeowners about, that's not necessarily deer yeah, management, right. but that's like managing your own property yeah, to but, make and, it and less five friendly. Five major yeah. years of drought in LA and Southern California when you're in that area in the southwest, people, when you go out there, less one, they go down, down to the uh, artificial stuff like they have at the bank. Or they go to rock gardens, like you mentioned, with little cactus type yeah. of things growing. Yeah. But it, finally, they got the huge amount of rain and, and, and throughout the southwest in California this year in snow, like they've never experienced. But yeah. They did have an impact. People did start to change. Keeping your grass shorter. Yeah. So that yeah. question was asked to Moses. Okay, yeah. if we had an arid, you know, climate or arid, do you know, environment or and he was talking about, yeah, people go to the desert type of landscaping. Sure. And it's of course it helps, but it helps on a local you know, so like maybe level. I was going to say maybe something like we, we, there, there was one property. It's on Dawn Lane that was sort of highlighted with the planning board and the greens and the CAC because they were so they basically um, um, applauded the applicant for creating this. It's called the seascape or dunescape. Yeah. And that's yeah. how they created their whole property. Yeah. And that would be like great for no ticks and no deer, really. Mm -hmm. So maybe something like that, you know, just. Getting more people like that. Well, we have, you know, obviously yeah. we we produced a couple of years ago, right? The, the integrated strategies, right? right? Yeah, right. 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 We, we sort of tried to block them into what you could do as a person, what you could do as a landowner, right. right. what you could do as like a, a large landowner organization, and homeowners association, things like that. So, I think the content, right? Content is never the problem. Right? No, we yeah. always have content, and right. as an organization, yeah. we have have made available tons of content in lots of different formats. Mm -hmm. It's just trying to get it to, to people in a, in a way can. that can digest. Right. And then so the question, we just need to revisit that. that you know, right, yeah. right. We can revisit that to some degree, but the other question is much like burning, okay, how many properties can you get to do it? And what kind of difference is it going to make for island wide? Right. All right. We, you know, we've talked about burning and, you know, how many spots could we burn? And would that make a difference island wide? And it's hard to justify, you know, endorsing that if it's not going to make a difference for the majority of this island. Don't say that when I'm trying to tap on my property. No, but your property is <laughs> so you can do that. It makes a big well, difference. Back, okay, so remember back in the fall that came up, yeah. and I, I added it to the agenda of some meeting, and you did, uh, I helped you generate a list, right. and we're just kind of hold, we're in a holding, because right. of timing and planning right. and this this is all this. But that still exists, right? It's it's a, yeah, it still exists, and the possibility to burn your property still exists. Right. But right. you have to get the permits and stuff like that. Right, right. The other issue is, you know, to get the, the the fire department to do it, and that's they guys are busy too. Right. Okay. Um, anyhow, I'm going to I'm going to call this. Unless anybody has anything else they have to say. Sorry to do that.
Um, but uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Thank you. In a second. Thank you. Second. Everybody, thank you very much. Okay.